and welcome everybody. It's another BB Book Buzz. Your Wakefield librarians are here to talk about what we've been reading re recently and hope that we can help you find your next great read. And I'm here today with Bridget Black and Beth Radcliffe and Jacqueline Powers, Jackie. Um, and I'm Karen Stern. And we have, as usual, a rollicking good variety for you today. Although we did think at the beginning, they're all, they're, none of them are light and uplifting today. They're <laughs> a little on the darker side. Um, and we're gonna start with Bridget. Okay, so I am going to talk about the new book from Lydia Millet. It's called A Children's Bible. I'll put it up to the camera up here. Uh, it is sort of a dark, speculative a little bit it's sort of sort of set in a near future present type situation that is mostly about a group of children who are on vacation with their parents who are friends so their their parents are friends and the kids know each other only through their parents and they have all gone to a vacation house that is an unspec in a sort of unspecified location we don't know where it is for the summer they're there all summer and the kids hate the parents like that's basically what it is they just hate they hate their parents they are playing a game where they are refusing to identify to the other kids who their parents are and so whoever can keep who their parents are secret the longest will win the game uh they rate they sort of range in age there are like older teenagers to young to probably about like four or five year old kids and they're all sort of in on it and they they are basically running wild while their parents <laughs> are having parties and, and this involved like a deserted island or something it, it feels kind like of <laughs> it kind of does like that it, it's a little oh. bit as if they are as if even though they are just on vacation but they are at this like grand estate that the parents have rented for the whole summer that they it's like they've been shipwrecked essentially like they are in their own society uh at various points they, they at one point they decide to take a camp they decide to camp on the beach rather than stay in the house with their parents so they go down to the beach where they meet a different group of kids who are also with their parents uh everyone is kind of nominally rich in this situation that's how they can rent the house but they meet like super rich parents <laughs> and these the they've come on like a yacht and they meet the kids there and they they go to the yacht as well and they have sort of an adventure there but it turns out like those kids also hate their parents but are better at sucking up because <laughs> they are so rich that they would like to stay in their good graces god this <laughs> really is bleak yeah so <laughs> It's like a generational problem. And I think one of the things that is very, that becomes clear is there is a huge like storm. They're like a giant hurricane that wipes out the power and, and essentially like maroons them in this house when they head back to the house. It like maroons them in this house with the parents and they're all alone, cut off from everything. And the storm is obviously like, it's an actual storm, but it's also sort of an indication of climate change and the world ending like it is not <laughs> that's why i say it's it's not a cheery book it's very bleak this is sort of the the harbinger of the end of the world because it, it in a way that it is at least the end of their world as it existed in the in society and sort of how things go and so i say so obviously what the tension between the adults and the kids is because the kids are like you ruined the world to the parents like, the <laughs> parents are the people who destroyed the world and they have to like they the kids are inheriting this world that will not work which i think is a tension that we kind of can see in the in playing out in society today which is a generational divide between younger people who are like you let climate change happen you didn't do anything to stop it you're still not doing anything to stop it and you're going to to be like to kids being like well you're going to be dead and i have to live in this world and i potentially have to have children in this world and how does that like how will that affect the rest of my life so this definitely i feel i feel very strongly that that's sort of the undercurrent of the of the book is that is, is that connection but and like class differences because even if it's here between sort of just comfortable people and it'd be extremely wealthy like what does happen when society breaks down uh i found it very compelling it's written very simply so i would say it's extremely not overwritten it's very like matter of fact in tone it is narrated in the first person from one of the children whose name is Eve. Um, she has a younger brother 
who is like basically the only thing she really cares about is like protecting her younger brother who is he is where the title comes from because one of one of the parents gave him a gave him a children's bible when they're there and he takes it as an instruction manual for what to do after cataclysm so the storm represents noah's ark so he he and another of the little kids are collecting animals so that they can save them uh what it like what is god it's science you know we may like go he was very into it like jesus is science how does it work in the world it's and it's very more sophisticated than i think he's about six might um you might expect uh and that sort of threads through the book as we we follow these characters through to some pretty bleak places i will say like some the, it there is a there are some very dark and like scary things that happen to them because they are separated from their parents for most of it. So it is like kids on their own and some scary things happen to them, but I found it a very moving book. It's not uplifting, but it's moving. And if you are in the mood for bleak, <laughs> I would say- Is that there it, any hope? Is there any kind of hopeful undercurrent or is it really just like, hmm, we're screwed? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it sounds like there's the potential that there's some kind of rebuilding going on if that, if this, but, but maybe not. I think there's, there are sections where it seems like that's possible. It doesn't really end on that note to me. Uh, I think it sort of ends on a downbeat note, even though I, I will say like Eve, the narrator does manage to keep hope mostly for her younger brother, Jack, she's, she's keeping the hope for him, but she also is a realist and sort of wants to, doesn't want him to expect uh, good My things. family almost did that as a family read, um, for all of us read. And I was kind of relieved because I had heard how bleak it was, but I heard her speak. She was on with um, uh, Ophil Weather, which oh. is another oh. cosmic what change yep. book. They both said that their books are very short. So I thought, hmm. And, and the narrator, not the narrator, the moderator said she read it in one sitting or one day. So I thought, well, Maybe I could do it then. If it's just, you know, if it's one day, <laughs> one bleak day. <laughs> yeah, it's, it is. It is short. It's a fast read. I will say, like it, it does pull you through. It's as I said, it's very sort of simply written. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I don't. I I did not get any sort of hopefulness or uh, no uplifting elements. It has some funny lines. Like I will say that I also laughed at this book. It's kind of. I would say it's like of, of dark satire at times. And so there are definitely things that will make you, that will make you laugh, but it won't leave you, it, but it left me feeling quite down. <laughs> so, it's yeah. funny, you know, people take books different ways too. And, you know, Jeff, Jeff did the whole, he, he talked weather, what was it last time? I think the Jenny Ophel, Ophel book. Um, and so I thought, oh, I really want to read that. It sounds great. And I dove in and that one got me big time. Like she does such a good job of recreating the anxiety that we're all in every single day. And I can read speculative fiction. I can read, you know, all kinds of things that take me way out of this world and into another one. But I found my limit in Jenny Awful because it was like- Karen actually texted me and told me not to read it. <laughs> I did. <laughs> I was like, no, 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 no. I don't need anybody to recreate that for me. So, you know, it, it different books hit people in different ways. I'm not saying this isn't bleak. It sounds pretty bleak, but- yeah. um, and, and that's why I would say that this isn't, like this didn't recreate those things. Like it didn't give me anxiety to read it. It's right. just, it's just not, it's just kind of like, dark it's just like a dark yeah. book yeah, yeah. It didn't, it's not anxiety inducing and it's not since partially because the narrator is a girl is just a teen girl who doesn't maybe know is, is also like act there's part where I really identified with the narrator because there's parts where she's like actively ignoring the news because it's always bad <laughs> and she's like well I, why would I check the news it's the same thing and it's always bad so I'm not going to 
like even though she has a phone that works she doesn't like they're that's what they're disconnected but like by choice because she doesn't right want to read those things I think we all feel that way <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's, it, that's yeah. kind of a relatable feeling and I would say like like I said I don't I don't find it anxiety inducing I just found it kind of down like it's just a downer <laughs> one of the other things I found fascinating is that those two authors Ofo and the Emilette they they know each other I, I didn't come in early enough to know if they're friends but they send each other their books their manuscripts ah interesting. Oh, interesting fascinating and they're totally I mean okay they're both climate change but they're totally different books mm. and they're not they're not writing Quite at the same time, because uh, well, they're they're kind of a cohort, I guess, of a certain cohort, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. There is a I will say there is a quote from Jenny Offal in the back of this book that says, uh -huh. Lydia Millet is a stone cold genius." A <laughs> <laughs> little help from your friends, always good. Yeah, but that's right. so that's a children's bible. I if if you're in the mood, I thought it was very well written. I really, really did enjoy it, but for what it was. Good. <laughs> okay. I have one, um, not nearly on the scale of bleak that you're talking about. Um, and I know that ton of French fans are very excited because the new one is here. It's called The Searcher. And I'm just gonna say a little bit about French because old French and new French are slightly different. And I wanna just talk about some of the ways that they are um, different. For those of you who don't know French, she's the author, an author who lives in Ireland and who, but she was actually born in the US. Um, she, I think she lived all over the world as a kid. She's, that is relevant to the, this book in ways that I'm gonna explain fairly soon, but um, she has written eight books now. The first six of which are from, um, form a series of really fantastic police procedurals all under the heading of the Dublin Murder Squad. I'd say they're kind of less a series than like an archipelago of, yeah of gritty Loosely connected. Um, involving all they all involve different detectives from the Dublin murder squad which is by the way not an organization that actually exists but um but then French will take like a secondary character from one novel and make the, him or her the main character in the next um so it's a fantastic series with city settings kind of perfect pacing and intensity equally intense deeply mined characters all of whom are detectives. Um, and then as always with French, there's just like this lush, beautiful prose. Um, so then her latest books, the seventh one, which was The Witch, Witch Owl, which I talked about earlier in this space. Um, and then this one, The Searcher, um, move away from the detective's point of view. So um, you may have some bells ringing in the back of your head when you hear the title. The Searcher, and that's because French title is apparently a direct nod to the John Ford movie, The Searchers, which is a Western starring John Wayne. And so the parallels are that in both st stories, the main character is this kind of outsider. In this case, the main character is Cal. He's an ex-cop from Chicago. And that main character then comes to this remote, seemingly peaceful, beautiful place to settle down to the quiet life, only to be drawn into something darker that lurks beneath this, the idyllic surface. Um, so the setting in this one, of course, is not the Wild West, but it is Ireland, um, though it is Western Ireland. I don't know if she did that on purpose. Um, and then the countryside is, is obviously this kind of lush, green, alluring. Um, in French's telling, it's also really intric intricately woven into this slowly unfurling plot. And I wanted to make the point of the slow unfurling because it's definitely a hallmark of this book and it is very much different from the pacing of the Dublin Murder Squad. So for people who are you know, huge fans of Dublin Murder Squad, again, you don't wanna expect that kind of, I mean, you'd never call like the Dublin Murder Squad like blazing page turners. They don't, it's not like, no. I don't know, Patterson or somebody, but she definitely prefer, prefers to go deep and, into character, into setting, and with a steady reveal, but that always is going and going and making you want more. The reveal here is absolutely this slow, subtle burn um, in contrast to that, the other series. Um, and the feeling of this book for me was rather than like forward motion, it was more like digging down 
or peeling away to discover the kind of the underbelly of the story. So now I haven't told you very much of the plot and I'm sorry, um, but there's a kind of a reason for that because in that, that slow burn way, it's all in the details. And so I don't wanna to give too much away, the details and the characters in this book. So here's the basic teaser. So Cal, outsider cop, Chicago cop, divorced, comes to rural Ireland to get away from it all, has a, buys an old house, fixing it up. When his cop's instincts tell him that he's being watched, when he finally nabs the watcher, it turns out to be this like 11, 12 year old kid who's heard that Cal is an ex-cop um, and Trey, the kid has decided that that means that Cal is the person who should help find Trey's older brother who has been missing for like six or seven months. And Cal's kind of almost this, two, I, I would almost say two stereotype gruff guy with a heart of gold, um, grudgingly allows himself to be drawn into the mystery. Um, and it's a mystery. That sounds that like falls. a Wayne thing, right? The Oh yeah, totally. It's it's very much a parallel to the searchers. I mean, she uh, that was obviously on purpose. Um, but this mo this one involves you know the mystery involves like murdered sheep, and rowdy nights in drinking poteen in lonely pubs and achingly beautiful tramps and drives through fields and lanes of you know rural Ireland, which she does so amazingly well. I mean, she just writes like a dream. And then of course a town with a lot of secrets that an outsider is not really going to be privy to and will have to do a lot of uncovering to find out. So I would say, you know, sit yourself down, wrap up, get ready for a deep read and, and you know, prepare to be transported. Um, if anybody with a connection to Ireland, you have to read all of French really because yeah. she just does it so well, the settings. And, and, you know, I think this one's particularly cool because it's an American going to Ireland. And there are definitely, you know, the layers, not only of the mystery that she's trying to appeal, but you know how it is when, if you've ever lived in another country, <laughs> there's a lot to learn, you know, of, of layers of culture that you're also trying to unpeel, so. Um, it's, it's funny because it wasn't, like you said, it's not a fast read, but I read it. I, with my very small children, read it in one weekend, like yeah. it, you, you do keep wanting, I mean, I think that's oh. a, a testament to how good a writer, she's that good a writer. Oh yeah, no, you can't, you can't. Constantly, you know, and you never know when it's gonna like come to a head. Uh, it, it's, but she's the, really good that way. She is so good that way. I mean, I would, you could, anything she ever writes, I will always read. Like it, mm -hmm. I can't recommend her highly enough in terms of great, and I'm not like a mystery person. I'm not really, a, I, I like, I do like p police, procedurals more than your kind of basic mystery but um there's Hers something about just, her it's character because she does character just uh, unbelievably well it's all her stories are not really about the mystery I feel like that's it's about who the detective figures out you know in the procedurals it's yeah. like the detective is learning about themselves through the course of the mystery and that to me is the real story and also yeah learning about themselves and the connections to other people in the story the, and you know you're right constantly in touch with that main character's emotions in a way that you know not all writers do and again the scene the setting she's amazing she's amazing at setting yeah so that's ton of french the searchers sorry the searcher <laughs> searcher yeah <laughs> singular searcher a single singular searcher. All right. Um, who was Beth. Gonna... Beth? Yes. So my book is called um, "Code Name Helene" by Ariel Lawson. Let's see if I can get it without the, the <laughs> without glare. the glare. Yeah. yeah. All right. We'll stick a picture up. Yeah. And um, this is a historical novel based on the life of Nancy Wake, an Australian um, with Maori bloodlines who parachuted into. Vichy France during World War II to organize, arm, fund, and train those French resistance fighters that were based in the center of France. So it's a fascinating, barely fictionalized biography that's told in dual timelines. So it's the 1930s with Nancy's whirlwind romance with a wealthy, wealthy French industrialist. Um, and that's intertwined with her life just eight years later, it's not a big time leap, but eight years later with the war. Um, and then the first half of the bo book deals mostly with the sexual tension with her soon to be husband. And I, 
you know, Leanne, who is our wonderful queen of fiction, would love it. It's really great sexual tension. The second half is much more about the war and all the intrigue that Nancy um, Wake is involved in. So Nancy Wake was this courageous, outrageous person. In the 1930s, she was working as a newspaper reporter for the Hearst Syndicate, um, but you can't find anything by her because Hearst didn't believe in giving women bylines. So you can't find them. Um, when the Nazis invade France, she helped in the war effort doing various things that I'll let you read about um, until she eventually went to do this arming of the French resistance. Now, as you can see, I am not one for lipstick and makeup, but Nancy Wake was. That was a part of her. She always wore her red victory lipstick. She was glamor, guts, and sexuality. And Lawhorn doesn't shy away from it. In fact, she dives into it. Sometimes I think a little too much. I think that could have been edited a bit, but just that's, that's the authentic, it was an authentic part of Nancy Wake. Um, another trait of hers was that she was known for her body language. And since it's told with some of her actual quotes because she wrote an autobiography, um, there's a lot of cursing in it. And some of it is in French. And <laughs> her colleague, Jeff, who is a Francophile, I think will love it. I think he'll love this book just because of the French cursing. <laughs> um, the characters that surround her are really well done. Her husband, um, her radio operator, her other commanders in arms, they're all really well rendered. Um, the enemy tends to be a little more two-dimensional, although we're talking Nazis here, um, and only a few individualized ones um, at that. Let's see, what else do I want to tell you about it? Um, she does a good job of setting the various scenes and Nancy travels a lot, both for the, uh, the resistance and she's wealthy from her husband. She wasn't wealthy before. Um, she draws all those various places she goes to with color and clarity. Her palette goes from menace to tranquility, from hardship to luxury. Nancy Wakes experienced all of those, including very base sexism from the men under her control. Some of the book was hard. It is, after all, the war, death and destruction. But there's also some very vivid torture scenes that were disturbing. Um, I suppose you could flip through those. It's, she did a lot of research. Um, great. It's a great jumping off point to learn more about Nancy Wake. I, I went online to see if I could read a little more. And even though the author stuffs a lot of information, there was still more to be had, more amazing stories that she had. Um, so if you're interested in women spies during wars, it's a great book to jump off to read other books too. There's, yeah, there are quite a few yeah. other ones out there right now. Um, Does, has she done this before? Um, the author written a book because I feel like it was there something called the was it the mistress or something that I think was hers that I uh, it was like a judge and the judge's wife and the mistress and I think that I, I read it as you know thinking it was fiction and found out after the fact that it was based in the same way kind of like when I true story fiction the mistress and the something the something that wasn't written by her that wasn't her okay no it was just the, the style was ringing a bell yeah um but there's the the Alice Network by Kate Quinn. Oh, right. So that's a fictionalized account, World War One, but it's a woman who goes up to the northern part of France where the Germans have have infiltrated, have gone over the border. And our uh, our nonfiction book for bo books by the lake this year is called A Woman of No Importance by Purnell, um, and that's that's as I said, nonfiction, true, but you know, same yeah. kind of World War Two, same yeah. year era. I just saw it, paper, yesterday's paper that another woman who was a spy just died. And oh, she, wow. Yeah, she went, she was also a sociolite, so, so, socialite like Nancy Wake became. Mm -hmm. um, and she went into Spain 
during World War II to keep her ears open, find out who was, um, who was, who was, who liked the Nazis and found out that it was the, um, the flamingo dancers. So she joined a class to learn flamingos. I, these women are just- I know, the stories amazing. are amazing. Amazing, amazing. Yeah. There's also the Lilac Girls mm -hmm. by Mary Paul Kelly. That's World War II. That's actually about Ravensbrück, which was a concentration camp, the only concentration camp for women only. And they did um, medical experiments on the women. But it's the uh, three women connecting through Ravensbrook. And then Sea Garden by Deborah Lawrenson, which is three novellas that are about strong women, World War II spies. So there's a lot of great stuff to go to from, from this. Yeah, I can see that as like a, a winter reading shelf. Yeah, really. Yeah. <laughs> Women very spies. Inspirational, very inspirational. Yeah, yeah. Lots of things to, to watch too. Like there's lots of, I know that there's at least one fictional TV portrayal of Nancy Wake as well. Yeah. On BBC television, and I'm sure there's more. There was um. Uh, there was one that was a composite of different women, including Nancy Wake, which was um, who's the woman that's in the Lord of the Rings trilogy, who's the queen of the fairies, the elves, the queen of the elves. Oh, um. Kate Blanchett. Yeah. yeah, that she's that she's in. Thank you so much, Bridget. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, Beth. Uh, and last we have Jacqueline. Um, all right, so again, not super happy, but okay. Uh, <laughs> I read uh, Luster by Raven Leilani, um, and this was is her first book. It's fiction, um, and I thought the title was just perfect because the writing is truly lustrous. It's vivid. It's visceral. It's sometimes heartbreakingly beautiful, while not being. I wouldn't call it like flowery. It's pretty straightforward. It's it's um, told in the first person. The narrator is Edie. She's a 20 something um, black woman. She's trying to get by in New York City. She's got a, some dead end job um, at a publishing house. Uh, she has a terrible apartment with like dead mice everywhere. And it's like an hour commute from her job. <laughs> and she keeps making a lot of questionable decisions in her personal life. And kind of amidst all this, she, is an artist and she's trying to kind of find herself as an artist. She's trying to lean into that, um, I think as a career and, and kind of keeps coming up against roadblocks there. But we, we meet her at the beginning of a relationship that she's having with a married white man from New Jersey. Um, he's an archivist in the library, uh, which you don't, I don't think you really find out until a little bit later, but he claims to have an open marriage, but there are rules set by the wife um, and we do meet the wife later, and we, we also meet, his, uh, his name is Eric, and we meet his adopted daughter, who is, um, I think, 12, and she's Black, and they've only recently adopted her within the last, like, year, and the family is really interesting because the characters are somehow both really sharply drawn and also a little bit vague, and so the, the wife, Rebecca, uh, performs autopsies, um, she is somehow hyper confident and competent, yet hugely awkward, like just very awkward. <laughs> um, the daughter is, you know, like this longtime foster child um, who, who has just now come out of the system. They've, they've adopted her and she's a little, you know, she likes video games. You, she's, she's a little harder to read. I think that's part of her, you know, the result of her upbringing, the fact that she's been bounced around a lot. Um, and Eric is kind of the most undefined. He's sort of this hazy figure who is really central to the plot, but just sort of keeps drifting further off the page. The more you get into the book, it stops being about him like pretty early on. Um, and it sort of stops being about his relationship with Edie fairly early on. Um, the trajectory of the story is really worth discovering on your own. I think I liked it having, I literally read none of it. Someone said they liked it and I just picked it up. I didn't read, I had no idea what it was about. And I, I, I think that I, I benefited from it, from that a little bit. Um, I think it's better to kind of discover on your own. Um, 
but it is sometimes laugh out loud funny. Like there are parts that are just so ridiculous that you're like, <laughs> um, it's, as I said, can be very awkward. Sometimes it's just bizarre. The situations are just bizarre. Um, her Edie's kind of stream of consciousness narration is um, she's sometimes really caustic. She's sometimes very endearing. She's startlingly self-aware. Um, she's very cognizant of why she is the way she is and how she kind of ended up in the place she is. She's not, she has no illusions about who she is and why she is that way. Um, I didn't have high hopes for a really satisfying ending, ending and I was kind of surprised by the amount of closure that the, the author brought. It's not, it's definitely not like a happily ever after, but you do feel like everyone came away from it having gained something, whether that was a good thing or whether it was just a better understanding of something, a better understanding of the world. Um, they're all, so you all sort of feel like they're on the path they're supposed to be, whether that will be good or bad, it's the way that they're supposed to go. Um, and they're better, they're better in some ways for having known each other. Um, this was a real dark one for me. Like I found this to be very, her, her, her Edie's upbringing was very painful. Her struggles with emerging adulthood are real and ring very true. Um, but there's all these kind of moments of levity and kind of unexpected warmth that kind of balance out that grittiness. And it makes it, it makes it easier to see the light amid the darkness. I think it's the author does a really nice job of balancing the, the kind of the light in the dark, which I feel like comes back to the title and comes back to this idea that she's an artist and that there is always this play of, of light and dark and that things aren't necessarily just one way or the other and they grow and change. And um, you see all the characters kind of grow and change a little bit here. So it's a pretty quick book. I mean, it's, it's less than 300 pages, 250 maybe. Um, and it, there's not like a rollicking plot, <laughs> but uh but it did keep it does keep you keep going and keep you interested. So I would highly recommend that. That was Luster by Raven Leilani. That sounds really interesting. All of them do. Yeah. And that's it. Wow, we're done. And that brings us to the end. And that brings us to the end. Well, we hope you've um, enjoyed and found something in all of this. Hopefully, not too bleak bleakness. Um, that, that <laughs> something you, in the dark. You can light for lighter, right? Is that yeah. yeah. Sometimes you have to go that way. And like you said, you balance the light and the dark. Um, Beth's was not bleak necessarily. No. Anyway, um, we hope you'll join us next time for the, uh, for the next edition. And don't forget that you can go to our website, wakefieldlibrary.org and find um, on our side door service page, which is you'll, you can click on, it's a rotating photo on the front and you can click on it and it takes you to a wealth of things, books to browse because we know you can't be in the building at the moment. Um, you can see our buzz table books. You can see our new nonfiction, our new fiction, our paperbacks, our uh, DVDs. It's all there for you to choose from. And if you can't find anything that way, give us a call on 781-619-1100 and we can help you out in person. All right, thanks a lot for joining us today. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.